and welcome back to Bible Picture Prophecies. If you hear a little extra noise tonight, it's because my canner downstairs is singing, because not only do we believe in studying prophecy, we believe in canning up Daniel's miracle diet found in Daniel chapter 1. So today we're going to be studying Daniel from Daniel chapter 7. And we began studying in Daniel chapter 2, and we've skipped over a few chapters here. And I would suggest that if you've not read those before, you go back and read through some of the stories found between Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. We'll touch on a few tonight. Before we get totally into our study here, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, and please be with us as we dig into your word and try to learn the things that you would have us know about the future and please lead us and guide us help my words to be your words and help them to be clear and concise and send your holy spirit amen okay i want to go over a few points from last time the purpose of prophecy is to help us to build faith in jesus the whole Bible revolves around the story of Jesus, and so does prophecy. John 13, 19 says, Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. This was Jesus talking to his disciples. So the purpose of prophecy is when it happens that we will believe that Jesus is God. It also is given to give us warnings. There are many things that we need to learn before the second advent of Christ. And also, it is to help us to build character and to teach us to study. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And the reason I put this scripture in there again is to remind us that prophecy is not of any private interpretation. So we want to take the Bible and use it to interpret itself. We can't just say, well, I think a sheep represents uh, whatever I want it to represent. Or I don't just think a beast represents something that I make up. We want to take the Bible to interpret itself. And this is found in 1 Corinthians 2.13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So instead of saying, I think this is going to represent this, we take the Bible, we find the word, and then we find it again used in the Bible to find the interpretation and use the Bible as its own interpreter. Now, I don't know how many of you plant a garden, but when you plant a garden, you plant multiple different lines of food. You may have your tomato line and your lettuce line and your radish line. And all those different lines, when you go to make a salad, you may take all of those and pick from them and put them together to make a nice salad. And the Bible and prophecy is somewhat like that. Isaiah 28, 9 and 10 says, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And then verse 13, But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. And so this shows that because of the way the Word of God is set up, many people don't understand it properly. But if we can understand the concept that it's precept upon precept, precept upon precept, and line upon line, then that will help us out. And here's a picture of an 1863 prophetic chart. You can see some of the prophecies lined up. You see the image that we studied last time of Daniel 2, and it's lined up with the things in Daniel chapter 7 and then some from Daniel chapter 9 and also from Revelation. Prophecy may be studied line upon line. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Studying the Bible is kind of like a treasure hunt. It requires some effort. You can't just surface read and decide that, like I said before, that this is going to represent whatever you think at that moment it may represent. You've got to have some persevering effort and dig in to find the true meaning. And we're going to start today in Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. So let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to read the first three verses. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens drove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. And so here, this time, instead of Nebuchadnezzar, it's Daniel that's having a vision while he's asleep, and he sees four beasts coming up from the sea. So one of the treasure hunting tips is we want to check for some hints close by to see if we can find any meanings for some of the figures that are used in the in the prophecy. And so we saw four beasts, and in Daniel 7, chapter 17, it gives us a really big hint as to what these beasts are. It says, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall rise out of the earth. Now, if we start and decide to make an educated guess, we'll remember that when we studied Daniel chapter 2, we had a metallic image, and it represented also kingdoms. And we might think that maybe these beasts are equivalent to some of the parts of the image. So that would be an educated guess. But let's go forward and see if that's a good educated, educated guess. Okay, Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. And what we're going to do with this verse, we already read it through, but we'll read it again here. We're going to pick out some of the nouns, or if you want to call them the objects, some of the figures that are used in here, and find out the meaning of them. What do they mean? Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So we're going to go through and figure out what winds represent, what the sea represents, and we already got a really big hint of what the beasts represent. They represent kingdoms. So wind in the Bible is a representation of strife or war. Now, if I'm going to say that, I can't just say, well, I think this is what this means. I need some text to prove my point. So we look in the Bible and find some proof texts, some text to prove what wind is. If you were doing this by yourself, you might find a concordance and look up the word wind and see where else it's used in the Bible and follow it through to see if you can figure out what the meaning is. And here's a couple for you already. Jeremiah 25, 32, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast, from the coast of the earth. And again in Zechariah 7, 14, But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. So here you can see kind of the clashing of nation against nation. This is strife and war between nations that causes things to move about. And if we follow out, okay, so that was wind, and this is going to be sea. What does the sea represent in this prophecy? The sea in the Bible represents peoples or nations. But again, I can't say, well, this is what it represents. I have to look in God's Word to establish what I believe. And this one is pretty easy because in the book of Revelation, which is Daniel's counterpart, very often Revelation helps us to understand Daniel. It says, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. 
So you can see immediately that the C represents peoples and nations. And again, in Isaiah 17, 13, the nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, and they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. So when we can, it's very good to have a couple of witnesses uh, in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. So there's two proof texts to show that the C represents peoples or nations. Now what we're going to do is take these, we're going to take these words and we're going to put them into the verse. So you can see there where it says winds, I've put wars because that's war and strife. Okay, and where it says the great sea, I've got nations. And where it says the great beast, I've got kingdoms. And again, where the sea is, I have nations. So if we paraphrase this and put it in our own words, what Daniel is seeing is war and strife among the nations, and it's causing the rise and fall of kingdoms. So this is what's happening. He's watching in his vision. Now we're going to move on to Daniel chapter 7, verse 4. And this is the first beast that we encounter. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and, a man, and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given unto it. So the first beast that we're going to try to figure out what it is is a lion. This is no ordinary lion because it has eagle's wings. But first we're going to establish what a lion is. And some of this you can maybe get from God's book of nature also. But let's see if we can find some lion proof text in the Bible. So in 2 Samuel 17.10 it says, He also that is valiant, whose heart is as the heart of a lion, shall utterly melt. For all, all Israel knoweth that thy father is a mighty man, and they which be with him are valiant men. So here you see that when you have a heart as the heart of a lion, it um, is showing someone that is valiant, a mighty man. Okay? And also a second witness here, Proverbs 30:30, 30, 30, A lion which is strongest among the beast, and turneth not away for any. So lions are courageous and they're not really scared of anything they're mighty in war now a lion is a good illustration of a figure um, to start with because lions represent several things in the Bible and when we do a prophecy puzzle every word and particular must match the proposed interpretation so if it happens to be negative, you're going to have a negative meaning. If the surrounding is all negative. If it's positive, you're going to have a positive meaning. And this is important when we're finding out what a lion represents. Here, we're going to just contrast a good lion with a bad lion. If you have a good lion, you might say he's kingly. He's the king of the jungle. He rules well, and he's very powerful. And in Revelation 5.5, 5, we find a lion that is like this and has these characteristics. Because it says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And this is a representation of Christ. So he is also represented as a lion because he's kingly, he rules well, and is powerful. And those are all characteristics of a lion. However, in 1 Peter 5.8, we see a bad lion, a negative lion. Because a lion can also be powerful, but he can also be destructive. And Peter warns, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So you can see that the same figure can sometimes be used um, throughout different places in the Bible to represent either something good or something bad. And by reading the context around it, you're going to have to decide which is the meaning that fits there. Now in this case, actually, the lion 
neither represents Christ or Satan exactly because we already learned that it represented a kingdom and our educated guess was that it might correspond with the head of the image now I don't know if any of you remember what the head of the image was but it was Babylon and interestingly enough lions and wings were used in Babylonian architecture you can see them here in the picture behind the king and on the walls there were lots of lions and there were these creatures with wings this is a picture of the Ishtar gate um, a model that they made and in both Assyrian and Babylonian architecture there were many lions used so the lion is actually a very good uh, illustration of Babylon okay so it said the first was like a lion that had eagle's wings so the lion in this prophecy is going to be equal to Babylon it does match up to the head and you can find a proof text for this in scripture showing that a lion can represent Babylon also Jeremiah 50 verse 17 it says Israel is a scattered sheep the lions have driven him away first the king of Assyria hath devoured him and last this Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon hath broken his bones so the lion in scripture can be used to represent Babylon also now the next strange part of this lion because lions don't usually have wings so we can assume immediately that this is has uh, an interpretation something we're supposed to learn more about this lion by the wing by the wings if you're trying to get somewhere and you want to get there fast you're not gonna hike you're not gonna drive a car even if it's a fast one you're not going to take a boat. You're not going to take a train. If I want to get all the way around the world, I very quickly, I want a plane. Why? It has wings. Wings represent speed. And here's a couple of proof texts to show that eagle's wings represent speed. Habakkuk 1, 6 through 8. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. Their horses also are swifter than leopards. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. So the eagle, when he catches his prey, it's a very quick process. Hasty, that's speed. Deuteronomy 28:49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle that flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. So again, eagle's wings represent swiftness and speed. And we can see this from the proof texts in the Bible. Okay, so what happens to this lion? This lion, Daniel watches until the wings thereof were plucked and it's lifted up from the earth and it's made to stand on its feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it now we already talked about a lion heart lion's heart represents being valiant and courageous and not really being scared of anything uh, in history we have king richard who was known as the lion heart because even before he was made king he had a reputation as a great military leader and warrior. So a lion heart represents great military strength and warring. On the other hand, if you have a man's heart, if you have a lion's heart and a man's heart, who's going to run? If I meet a lion, I intend to run. So at some point, Babylon loses its lion heart and it becomes a little weaker and more scared and does not continue doing all the conquering that it did its wings are plucked so it's not being as swift to conquer its swiftness to conquer has become diminished and actually if we follow this out in the Bible in one of those chapters that we skipped over in Daniel 5 6 Belteshazzar is king and uh, or I'm sorry Belshazzar is king and the kingdom under him has become enfeebled through wealth and luxury and actually he gets pretty prideful and he even takes 
the um, dishes that came out of the sanctuary and he puts the wine of Babylon into them. And this is defiance really against God. So Babylon becomes proud, but as we know, pride can go before a fall. So, but he is, does not have the might and power of the kings before him. And it, when we look in Daniel 5, 6, he's facing off with God, essentially, with writing on the wall. And it says, Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. That's pretty scared. That doesn't sound like a lion anymore. He's pretty scared. His knees smote one against another. And that night, it says, was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. And here we see a picture of Cyrus, who was the general at the time, taking Babylon. So Babylon's wings were plucked. Those lion's wings were plucked, and it did not stay like a lion. And so then we're going to pass on to the next animal because we saw in uh, Daniel's dream the turning and overturning of nations. So uh, Medo-Persia takes over. In Daniel 7, 5, this is represented, and behold another beast, a second, like to a bear. And it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth, in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. So the Medo-Persian Empire was composed of two elements. And that's why this bear is raised up on one side, because the Persians actually were the leading element of Medo-Persia. So there were two sides, but the Persians were the higher leading element. We can see this in Daniel 6, one of those chapters that we um, skipped over a little bit. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and the, in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And also we can see the Medo-Persian Empire in the book of Esther. It talks about the power of Persia and Media. They ruled simultaneously together. Okay? And... Darius the king was a Mede. Cyrus was the leading general, and he later was the king, and he was a Persian. So in Daniel chapter 6, we saw the story of Daniel in the lion's den, and we saw um, that the, the law of the Medes and the Persians could not be changed. We also see this in the book of Esther. Okay, in the mouth of this bear, there were three ribs. Now we're going to use a little bit of common sense here. I've got my little picture of a cat, and he's trying to catch a fish in the bowl. If this cat catches his fish in the bowl, and then he has some bones left in his mouth, what do you think they came from? They came from what he conquered. Okay, so when a bear's got the bones in his mouth, they come from what he conquered. That's just kind of common sense. If you look at a map, you can see on the one side here what Assyria had conquered. And then Medo-Persia had conquered Lydia and Media and Babylon and all those, um, well, it was Media. It conquered Babylon and Lydia and Egypt. So all of that made up Media and Persia. So the three ribs denote those three provinces that it conquered, Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. Okay, and then it says about the bear, arise, devour much flesh. Now, from Proverbs 28, 15, we can see as a roaring lion and a raging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. And though Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and Cyrus, actually the Medes and Persians were not always kind people. There was a lot of bad things that went on um, under them. And Isaiah 13, 17, and 18 gives us a description of them. 
it says, Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. So there you see the bear arising and devouring much flesh. And also you can find, as I said before, kind of a description of the, the government of the Medes and Persians in the book of Esther. And there, of course, we find the evil Haman. But again, during the reign of the Medes and Persians, twice at least in the Bible, we have a story showing how the law of the Medes and the Persians could not be changed, even by the king himself. Okay, so we made an educated guess, and we have the lion lining up with the head that was Babylon, the bear lining up with the chest and arms of silver that was Medo-Persia, and then we have the next kingdom. And if you'll remember, the next kingdom was Greece. Now, Greece is represented as a leopard. And a few verses back, we read about leopards being swift. So we have a leopard who by himself is swift. But then on top of this, this leopard, let's read it here. It says, After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So we have a very swift running creature, and then on top of it, it has four wings. So if two wings represent speed, four wings represent unparalleled rapidity. There is a lot of speed here. There's, it's so fast that <clears throat> it's hard to picture. And this is actually what happened when Greece took over the kingdom and the world. Alexander, who's called the Great, is said to have conquered kingdoms more speedily than others could have marched their armies through them. That's pretty fast. So that's unparalleled rapidity. Again, the Bible is proven to be true by history. What God predicted is exactly to the very letter what happened. Now in this, we have four heads. So let's see if we can find out exactly what the four heads represent. If you think about it, what's in your head? Hopefully, if you're a thinking person, you know that you have a brain in your head, and your brain tells your body what to do. So it's kind of like the leader of your body. So a head represents leadership, but let's go and use the Bible again for a couple of proof texts just to make sure that we're guessing right, that a head represents leadership. Micah 3.9, Hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. So here we've got heads that are the princes, the leadership. Again in Psalm 110, 5 and 6, The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. So again, you can see that when the word heads is used here, it's showing the leadership, the kings, the princes, those that are in charge. So interesting here because we had Alexander taking the kingdom, Alexander the Great. Let's see how history lines up. Where are these four heads coming from? Well, history and prophecy must agree. Remember the puzzle? You need to have the color match. You need to have the shape match. Everything in the puzzle must agree for the piece to fit. History and prophecy must agree. God is very careful, and he doesn't make mistakes. So when he makes a prophecy, it's going to fit perfectly. Now, if we know the story of Alexander the Great, he inherited the kingdom when he was only 20 years old quite young. But again, he was quite young when he died. He died at age 32. And history tells us that he drunk a huge cup of alcohol 
and basically killed himself. He conquered the world, but he couldn't conquer his appetite, unfortunately. So when he died, his kingdom was split between his four generals. Ptolemy got Egypt to the south. Seleucus took Syria and the eastern division. Lysimachus had Asia Minor and the territory to the north, while Cassander had Greece, or the western division. So you see those four, four generals there, Ptolemy, Seleucus, Lysimachus, and Cassander. And hopefully I'm not being tested on how to pronounce those names. Okay, so there we see the four heads of the leopard, those four generals that began to rule. Now, in the next verse, we're going to talk about another beast. And let's go ahead and read this verse here. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now I know you're all interested to hear what this beast is, but because we're trying to keep these a little bit short, we're actually not going to talk about this beast too much tonight. That was just to get you interested for next time. But before we close, let's remember that prophecy is supposed to also be for character building. And this is something I believe that's often left out of studying prophecy. God has taught us so many things with prophecy. And each line, as we can see with the image, each time he repeats the prophecy, we learn a little bit more. So we're learning line upon line, precept upon precept. But let's not forget to draw a character building lesson. When we look at Babylon and this lion, there's a distinct object lesson given. Babylon became proud. And when it became proud, it didn't, it was not careful. It fell because it was prideful and even took the things of God and mixed them with the things of this world. And Proverbs 16, 18 warns us that pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. So we need to remember this as we learn prophecy and as we go forward in life. No matter how much we think we know, we need to remain humble and not become prideful like Babylon. Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall, and it surely did with Babylon. From Medo-Persia, we take note of the lesson that Medo-Persia, in the time of Daniel, when he was thrown in the lion's den, and also in the story of Esther, had a law that could not be changed, even by the king. And if man has a law that cannot be changed, Maybe we should take note of God's law, for he says in Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God's law does not change. It lasts forever. And because of the perpetuity, the fact that God's law could not be changed, Jesus Christ had to come and die in our place to atone for our sins because we have all sinned and broken God's law. And we're so thankful that he came and died for our sins. So let's remember, if man can have a law that doesn't change, how much more God has a law that doesn't change. From Greece, we might learn something from Alexander the Great. He was very quick to conquer everyone else, but he did not conquer his own spirit. He did not conquer appetite. He did not rule well his own spirit. Mark 8.36 says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? When we go about trying to build character, sometimes it might be nice to try to tell everybody how to build their character, but we really need to focus on conquering self.
self is the hardest thing to conquer that there is on earth. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So until next time, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So until next time, keep studying and we'll see you again and learn about that terrible, dreadful beast.